Battlefield Recovery there. And really, you know, the founder and visionary behind Battlefield and what we do, our family first approach. And then we've got Jeff. Here, let me put you on uh, spotlight. Jeff, for a moment. We got Jeff Costello in the house. Can we get you unmuted, Jeff? Can there you hear go. me? Hey, Jeff. Can yes. you hear me now? Yes. So we've got Hello. Jeff Costello from Tribeca Northwest Real Estate. Jeff's been a friend of ours for many years, 14 years in recovery himself. Is that right? 13, 14 years. 13 years. 13. I think, for, yeah, I'm coming on 14. I, I've kind of lost track at this point. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. One day at a time. <laughs> well, Jeff's been a friend of ours since the beginning. He's been a big support of Battlefield before we were even really a name. Uh, we've really appreciated your support through the years, uh, Jeff. Thank you so much. And now we're just so happy to have you part of our In the Spotlight um, as our host. And so Jeff is going to introduce our guest. So go ahead. Take it away, Jeff. All right. All right. I hey, just, hey you, Jeff, Andy. time out. Jeff, time out. I got to plug you for a second. Jeff was able to uh, get my house on the market. And um, before we got the sign planted in the ground, it was an offer was made and we accepted the offer. So in two days, without even a sign planted, uh, Jeff was able to get my house uh, hopefully sold if it goes through. So thank you, Jeff. And thank you for the great work your company does. Woo, 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 woo. Thank you. Thank Try you very Becca, much. Tribeca Northwest. All right. Thank you, Angie. And thank you, Art. I am so honored and blessed to be a part of this. So good evening. My name is Jeff Costello with Tribeca Northwest Real Living. And I'm in the business of helping and serving our clients and our friends with their real estate needs. I have personally known Art for years now, and I do consider him a good friend. And I love the fact that he, he entrusts me in helping him with one of his biggest investments. I absolutely love art and what his mission is, his voice, and what he brings to addiction and recovery. So welcome everybody to In the Spotlight with Battlefield Addiction. So from the traffic lightless town of Panoya, Colorado, in the heart of the Rocky Mountains, I'm super excited to introduce tonight's guest and speaker. And I've given him a new title, which I hope sticks, The Meditation Whisperer. Mr. Dave Smith. Dave Smith is an internationally recognized Buddhist meditation teacher, addiction treatment specialist, and a published author. His background is rooted in the insight meditation tradition, and he was empowered to teach through the Against the Stream Buddhist Meditation Society. He has an ex extensive experience in bringing meditation interventions into jails, prisons, youth attention centers, and addiction treatment facilities. Dave teaches residential meditation retreats and classes, provides training and consulting in both secular and Buddhist context, and works with students through his meditation mentoring program. He recently founded Rebel Saint Dharma, and I hope to hear a little more about that tonight. Dave tonight is going to share and give us some light on his practice of meditation, mindfulness, and employing the Dharma as a vehicle for overcoming addiction. I am personally excited to learn more about Dave and I hope he shares and gives us a taste of how he practices and how to deal with human emotion, recover, and awareness. But most importantly, how we can practice meditation in our crazy traffic light field lives. Welcome, Dave Smith. Thank you. It's good to see you. It's good to see you again, Angie and Art. And nice to meet you, Jeff, again. Um, is my audio acceptable? Yes, very good. Okay, good. Nothing worse than bad audio. <laughs> well, you know, it's hard for me. I'm happy to be here. I was with you guys a couple of years ago. I, I still think Battlefield Addiction is the most badass name of any addiction program thing I've ever heard. And I'll tell you what, I'll be texting you later because I want one of those t-shirts. One of those okay. hoodies. We'll get I you want, one. I want one bad. We'll get you one. Done. Uh, since I can't go to stores anymore, you know? Um, you know, I'm happy to be here. I, I have, a, there's a lot that I could say. There's a lot on my mind. It's a little challenging in this context because I'm wearing all my hats. First of all, I, I am a drug addict and an alcoholic and I've been sober uh, for 17 years, primarily uh, through the Alcoholics Anonymous program. Uh, very happy about that. I'm also a, a mindfulness teacher, a mindfulness practitioner. I'm also a Buddhist teacher. 
uh, and I'm also a, an addiction treatment specialist. I create curriculum and trainings for clinical environments all over the place. And I, um, the, the topic of addiction uh, is very near and dear to my heart um, because it's been a big struggle for me. It's been a big struggle for most of my friends. I'm, <laughs> most of my friends are in recovery. And my wife downstairs has got 25 years in recovery. Um, and I, I just think it's uh, one of the most beautiful things that people can engage in. And, and, and there's nothing better than watching somebody um, come out of addiction and into recovery. It's, it's, about, it's about the most beautiful thing that you can witness. It's also one of the hardest things that people do. And I know that right now uh, with what all that's going on in our culture and in, in the climate of the world, uh, that things are really hard right now for a lot of people. And I'm hearing people are relapsing really bad and people are really having a hard time out there right now. And, and if you are, uh, my heart goes out to you. I know that, that the, um, you know, life is hard. And I don't care who you are or where you're from. Uh, you're not going to get uh, you're not going to get out of this world without getting a little bit of suffering on you. And um, and that seems to be the challenge for everybody. Um, so just you know, I, I can say briefly. You know, my uh, I grew up in New England, and I grew up around alcohol. I grew up in the '80s. I'm a true Gen Xer. I grew up with MTV, I grew up with cable, I grew up with uh, all that stuff and uh, John Hughes movies. And I had, I had a great childhood. Um, I, I think what I've learned in recent years is that mostly my addiction was a manifestation of, of, of what we now know as trauma. Not that trauma is a new thing. Trauma has been around since uh, for <laughs> as long as people have been around. Uh, but uh, I had a couple big events in my early life that I think really set me on the set me off to the dark side. And, and the big one was at age 11, my older sister, who was about four years older than me, who was sort of my best friend and who I really looked up to. She was killed in a car accident tragically on, on the way to school. And, um, you know, I was 11 years old. <laughs> Nobody really talked to me about it. My parents didn't have the skills or the resources on how to help me walk through that. And, you know, one day my sister died and then a week later I'm back in school and everything's sort of back to normal. And, and that, that was the first time in my life I can remember walking into my school and going, I'm different than all these people. Uh, I, I feel different. Uh, the world feels different. Things are really kind of, you know, not good and terrible things happen. And why is nobody... Why is nobody talking about this? And so, you know, soon after that, I was drinking and doing drugs. Um, and, you know, <laughs> I'll tell you what, I would have never made it out of my teen years alive had it not been for drugs and alcohol. You know, that, that really got me through. And uh, another event that was important to me was when I was 18, uh, car accidents, as you'll learn, are sort of the theme of my life. Uh, I was 18, I just gotten out of high school and uh, me and a girlfriend got run down by a drunk driver as we were walking through a field in Western Massachusetts. Somebody was driving through the corn and like running the corn over and coming back onto the road. And they, they came back on the road and they hit us and she was killed on impact. Um, I obviously wasn't, but I flipped over the hood of the car and I was left there to find the body, uh, get the police, the ambulance. It was kind of your sort of hor horrific 911 gore scene. Uh, and that really, really, was a second trauma, but that, that was a trauma that I think really put me into dissociative kind of states and also put me into hypervigilant kind of states and also put me into full-blown alcoholism. At that point, I was so devastated. I was so upset. I was so, you know, and, and, and this is what was one of my struggles with recovery. I felt like sort of if there was a God that he didn't like me very much. Uh, and I sort of felt betrayed by the universe. And I just, I couldn't understand why these terrible things were happening to me. And so I drank at that. And um, I drank on that. I drank at that really well. And I got really into music. I got into punk rock music and ska and reggae music was very popular in Boston with the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones. And I had a music career for about 10 years uh, from 18 to 28. I had a lot of fun. Uh, and, you know, I just I became very, very selfish. Uh, because I, I used the excuse of the things that had happened to me and the, the difficulties I went through as a sort of, uh, you know, it was sort of my permission slip to do whatever I wanted to do, however I wanted to do it. I didn't want to get a job. I had no responsibility. I didn't get a bank account until I was almost 30. I just, you know, played in punk rock bands and just uh, alcohol was the theme of the day, every day. And then at, at, uh, 
And then also around that time, when I was 18, I also got introduced to what I like to call the Dharma, or what's known as the Dharma, which is what the Buddha taught. And I had the very good fortune of growing up down the street from a guy named Daniel Goleman. Some of you might know him as the emotional intelligence writer. He wrote a book in 1995 called Emotional Intelligence, which went on to be a world's bestseller. But I was friends with his kids. So I used to hang out at his house. And after the accident, I think uh, him and his wife, they knew something was like not uh, that not so that, that I, there was something wrong with me, essentially. That I, I was totally uh, traumatized. I didn't know it at the time. I actually didn't know it until about 10 years ago. Uh, and um, they brought me to the Insight Meditation Society, which is a, a meditation center in Massachusetts that was started by uh, Joseph Goldstein and Jack Cornfield and Sharon Salzberg, kind of the beginning of this whole insight a meditation, Vipassana, mindfulness movement that we find ourselves in now. And I learned meditation at 19 years old. And um, it was very profound. Uh, the big thing that I think that, that I could tell you that was a big takeaway for me and that maybe will be helpful to you is I got, I actually got some relief from my mind. I, I basically, you know, I lived in my mind and I, I couldn't make a distinction between there being a world and in my mind. It was all the same thing. And my mind was full of fear. My mind was full of hatred. My mind was full of confusion. Um, and I just lived in this kind of horror movie of my mind, this kind of traumatic, stressed out state of mind. And when I started to practice mindfulness, right at the beginning, it was literally, literally the first time I ever tried it, when I realized I could pay attention to my breathing or I could pay attention to my body, that I actually, I, could, I didn't have to be in my mind all the time. There was actually other places to be. And that was massive for me, that, that changed everything for me. Um, and I think it gave me a lot of relief from my traumatic stress symptoms. However, I continued to drink and do drugs for the next decade. So it didn't do the heavy lifting, um, but, but it did help me. And also there was this, the key thing for that, for me, there was a seed that got planted. There was, as, as we call in the Buddhist tradition, there was a Dharma transmission. There was, there, there, was, there was a sense that there was another way to live. There was another way to see things. There was something going on that I always sensed, but I could never really access. And I did go on to set retreats and practice over the next 10 years. And then I got sober in 2003, about 10 years after that experience. I was 28. I was my band. We were, we, were, we were living in Amsterdam. We were touring in Europe. We were doing very, very well. And I just, uh, I just, got lucky. I got desperate. I just, I couldn't take it anymore. I just, I just hated myself so much. I hated my band. I hated the world. Uh, I actually, the thing that really got me was I couldn't get enough of alcohol in my system in the waking hours of the day to get drunk. So I'd get drunk like every fifth day. Uh, and I would, I was doing, I was doing, I was a trash can. If you had it, I did it. I was doing bad cocaine, smoking tons of weed, eating weed, eating hash. Um, and I just, I just couldn't, I, I, I couldn't get the relief anymore. I wasn't getting anything out of it. And I remember walking back to my hotel room in Amsterdam with like a thousand dollars worth of drugs and alcohol pumping through my blood and feeling nothing, feeling stone cold sober. And then thinking to myself, I got to fucking do this again tomorrow. Are you kidding me? And, and I had that Dharma seat of like, I knew what I had to do. I knew I knew I had to quit my band. I had to move back in with mommy and daddy. I had to go to AA. Like I went to Alateen as a kid. I knew about AA and I knew for years my ass was going to end up sitting in that room eventually. And then I got sober. And, um, and then I sat a 90 day retreat with 60 days sober, which I don't recommend people do. Um, and then I, um, I got really humble where I kind of realized that Buddhism and Buddhist practice was not really what I needed. What I needed was like pretty severe behavioral modification. Um, and so Alcoholics Anonymous gave me that. I got sober in, in the Massachusetts in the Boston area. And it was, I got sober by a bunch of mean, mean, old, grumpy, big book thumping dudes and they saved my life. You know, my, my first sponsor was, a, was an Irish Catholic fireman in Holyoke, Massachusetts, 13 brothers and sisters, uh, old school AA, which is really what I needed. And I did that for about five years. Um, built a house, started a construction business, did all the things you're supposed to do, thrived, did really, really well. 
about five years into sobriety. I'd gotten married, built a house, you know, all your boy meets girl on AA campus. Uh, and then I, I wanted to get back into music. So I moved to Nashville, Tennessee. At that time, uh, Rick Rubin and Johnny Cash had been recording a bunch of albums together. Um, uh, Johnny Cash had been recording a bunch of these uh, solo albums with Johnny Cash. And so I got really inspired by country music and the, the, the themes of forgiveness and loss and redemption. Uh, ideas that I learned in recovery became very important to me. So I moved to Nashville to try to get music back together. And when I got to Nashville, Tennessee, uh, my life literally got pulled out from underneath the rug. So we could call this trauma number three, if you want to keep score. Uh, my wife, who I'd met in AA, she had relapsed. Um, she was drinking. She was doing drugs. She said she wasn't happy in the marriage. Uh, basically, within, within, we were in Nashville for 10 days. And on day 11 or 12, she ended up moving out. Long story short, she never got sober. She ended up actually getting murdered about five years later in Nashville, Tennessee. And it's one, it actually was on the front cover of the newspaper. It's, it was big news in Nashville because it was never solved. The crime was never solved. Um, and Nashville was really good for me because Nashville really put me on the path that I've been on now for the last maybe 12 years or so, integrating 12 steps with clinical work, with meditation, with Buddhism. And out of sheer desperation, I was at an AA meeting. I was picking up my five-year coin at an AA meeting about two days after my wife had left. And it was this punk rock dude named Tommy. I'll never forget him. He was at the meeting. We went out for coffee afterwards. And, uh, you know, he asked me how I was doing. I said, dude, I'm fucking out of my mind. I'm like, I've been here for 12 days and my life is just like, I'm like, this is not the promises, dude. You know, I'm not experiencing the promises right now. And, uh, and he worked at a drug and alcohol treatment center called Cumberland Heights, which is one of my favorite treatment centers in the country. Great 12-step treatment program in Nashville, Tennessee. He worked there at the youth program. And um, I, said, uh, I said, that sounds interesting. I didn't even know that. I'm from New England. We don't have treatment programs in New England. I didn't even know that people went to treatment. And he asked me, I said, I said you know, what do you have to do to work there? And he said, well, all you need is two years clean and a driver's license. Uh, so I started working with teenagers. Um, back in like 09 um, and I loved it. I was really good at it. It was one of those things I was good at, didn't make any sense. Probably I was good at it because let's be honest, I'm, a, I'm now at this point a 46 year old teenager. You know, like I never actually got out of that. I don't understand. I still don't believe that there's such a thing called adults. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but working with those kids, uh, really helped me deal, it really actually, to be honest with you, working with the teenagers really actually helped me heal a lot of my internal suffering of my teenage self. Being with those kids, working with those kids one-on-one, -on -one, connecting with those kids. And then I started to do groups. They let you do groups at the treatment center. And nobody wants, so this is what happens at Cumberland Heights on Sunday, everybody goes to chapel because it's Nashville. They gotta go to chapel. But because it's a treatment center and they have HIPAA laws, they can't make the kids go to chapel because it's a religious service. So the kids who don't want to go to chapel have to stay back and do spirituality group. Uh, and so I used to stay back and do spirituality group with usually like four or five kids. So I'm, you know, in, in, in the lounge, the youth lounge with five teenagers and we got to do a 90 minute spirituality group every Sunday, tough crowd, real tough crowd. And, um, it just turned into this really beautiful thing. It just turned into this conversation. I talked about Buddhism a little bit. We started doing some meditation. And then I started to develop these kind of mindfulness, 12 step based stuff. At that point, Kevin Griffin's book, Buddhism and the 12 Steps came out. And this whole Buddhism and recovery thing started to kind of emerge. And, um, and I did that for a couple of years. It was, it was really kind of, on, on some level, it was one of the best two years of my life. I was totally broke. You know, I, I had a construction business in Massachusetts. I was making, you know, $100,000 a year. And then I was in Nashville, Tennessee, working at a treatment center, making 12 bucks an hour. Um, and I couldn't have been happier. I lived in this crappy little house about five miles away from Cumberland Heights. And all I did was really spend time with those kids. And then I hooked up with, um, with Noah Levine at that time, who was somebody I'd known a little bit on and off over the years and started training with him. Uh, and against the stream and another organization he had called Mind Body Awareness Project. And then eventually I ended up selling my house in Massachusetts. Um, 
And I all of a sudden had some money. I made a little bit of money off the house. And things weren't really going well at Cumberland Heights. I kind of hit the glass ceiling there. They kind of didn't like the tattooed guy from Massachusetts who was sort of teaching Buddhism in a youth program. There was definitely some, uh, yeah, there was some pushback there. So I, I quit there and I ended up, I had a little bit of money. So I started giving, I started calling the local jails and the local treatment centers. And I sort of just said, I'm offering free mindfulness classes, you know. Um, and the great thing in the deep South about going in to do programs at jails and prisons and these kinds of places, they don't give a shit what you do. So you can say Buddhism, you can say whatever you want in those places because nobody's watching. So I started, I started teaching meditation at the Tennessee State Prison for Women, um, which was a tough crowd. Uh, but it was, um, it was really, really fun because I started to understand that the one thing I've learned in my, in my Buddhist studies is that everybody's mind kind of operates the same. Like we're all up, we're all running on the same like OS system, like mind 1.0. You know, all our minds, you know, we all, we all cling for pleasure. We all want to get what we want. We all want to avoid what we don't want. We'll do very, very odd and strange, strange, bizarre things to get pleasure and avoid pain. Like some of us will actually ruin our lives, chasing after pleasure, pushing away pain, you know? And then, the, so we, we're, all, we're all kind of in this mind experience of course, we have our subjective reality in the world we grew up in and our conditioning. But the one thing about Buddhist meditation and, and Buddhist psychology that's so helpful is it universalizes human experience. It's just, we're all in this kind of mind-body thing that doesn't, it's not a great device. I don't know what your mind is like, but I'm not very impressed with the design. You know, I, I think they could have done a better job before they sent it out. And, uh, and, and those of us with addiction can laugh because we know exactly what that's like. You know, when, when, when you're not using your mind, your mind is using you. And so I started to learn how to help people walk through their present time experience moment to moment to moment to see that they did have a, a lot more agency over, over their choices and over what they did than they thought. And so I, I kind of was just Johnny Appleseed in Nashville for like seven years when I lived there. I didn't want to teach people how to become meditation masters. I didn't, I had no big agenda. I just wanted to, get, I just wanted people to just see that little moment that I'd saw when I was 18. Just that little moment of like, hmm, maybe there's something going on here. Maybe I'm not seeing things clearly. Uh, this Dharma transmission, this sense of, of a possibility, the optimism of a possibility, the optimism of maybe my life could be different than it is. Uh, maybe uh, in just that alone, if, if, I, if you'd gotten that out of my class, I was happy. That was the most that I expected. Um, and so, you know, I was doing that. I, had so, I opened a meditation center and I really became um, also at that time in Nashville, Tennessee, I started doing uh, this very bizarre thing for myself called trauma therapy. I don't know if anybody, if any, if any of you out there, y'all have ever been traumatized or deal with trauma. Trauma therapy is very good now in our culture. I did things like EMDR, internal family systems, a whole bunch of stuff. I had a really great trauma therapist and holy shit, that was the strongest asset I've ever taken in my life because that was trauma therapy was, was a hell of a journey. I'm so glad I did it, but it was, it was such, such hard work. Um, and I'm really, really glad I did it because what I really learned was that um, my addiction was really actually a strategy that I developed to try to manage trauma. Um, it's not, I don't really feel, I mean, I have no problem saying I'm an addict. I'll go into any meeting and say I'm an addict, alcoholic. I don't have a problem with that. But my primary um, issue is trauma. And addiction just manifested uh, as a strategy to kind of just kind of manage traumatic stress symptoms. And, 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 and really up until a decade ago, most of my adult life, I've lived with fairly severe traumatic stress, stress symptoms. And I just thought that's how it was for everybody. But when I removed the addiction, when I stopped drinking and doing drugs and doing working a program and meditating and doing all that, the trauma, the trauma didn't go away. You know, it, it came with me. The trauma doesn't go away with the drugs and the alcohol, unfortunately, for many of us. Um, so I spent a lot of time, I did 102 hours of trauma therapy with this one woman in, in Nashville called Dr. Lee Norton. Um, and it really, 
it's almost hard to talk about it because so much of it is seen so nonverbal, but um, it really kind of put me back together uh, in a sense of, um, I didn't, uh, so for, for me, I had wicked severe symptoms of uh, hypervigilance. I, I walk into a room, I walk into a situation, I walk into a Trader Joe's or a Safeway and I am clocking every single movement that everybody in that room is making. You know, and I, I just, I didn't know that that was like a thing. I thought that's just how my mind operated. So I, I was really, uh, it's really hard to live with that kind of hypervigilance. Um, and so that, that got both mostly just kind of like knocked out. I don't really have that anymore. Um, at that time, the one thing that really got me into the work that I do now is I became, um, I, be, I started to get more, it was interesting, right? I was teaching emotional intelligence for years, but I didn't actually have any. You know, I was teaching these programs on emotions and feeling your emotions. And I, I created like clinical programming on emotional intelligence, but personally, I actually didn't have much. And what, what I experienced in trauma therapy was I, I got reintroduced to this emotion called sadness, um, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Maybe you're not. <laughs> I wasn't that familiar with it, it turned out. I, I had sort of avoided, I had sort of learned how to, to some degree I'd learned how to use meditation techniques. Um, I had learned how to use my narrative. Um, I kind of developed these brilliant strategies to absolutely not feel any sadness. Um, and I paid, I paid a big price for that. The, the, the one thing I've noticed, if, you, if, you, if, you're, if there's a particular emotion you're not feeling or you're not willing to feel, you're gonna get, there's gonna be side effects. And usually you'll find over time that the side effects of not dealing with the emotion is a lot more detrimental than just dealing with the damn emotion. And so getting reintroduced to sadness um, was of course no, no picnic um, because I also had the delusion uh, that because a lot of the stuff that happened in my life happened a long time ago, I walked around with this attitude of sort of like, I'm all better now. You know, I dealt with my stuff. I did the steps. I'm a meditator, yada, yada. And, and actually it just wasn't the case. And so trauma therapy, I started to realize that I, um, I had some stuff I needed to look at. I had, some, I had some work that I needed to do and I needed somebody to help me do it. I couldn't do it myself. Um, and you know, our, luckily our culture right now has really, really great interventions for that, for that kind of stuff. But yeah, that's the kind of stuff you really can't do on your own. There's a, there's a pamphlet in the, back of the, in the back of the AA meeting called Problems Other Than Alcohol. You may have seen this pamphlet. Well, this is, this is I, I definitely uh, qualify for that pamphlet in, in that sometimes we have to go outside of the the realm of our, of our 12 step work or out of any of our work. I had to go out of the realm of my Buddhist work to address some stuff. And so the good thing about that was I really, uh, once I kind of was able to open the emotional experience and integrate into the emotional experience and actually have access to sadness, the great news is the byproduct of, of, of having access to sadness is you actually get access to joy, right? So, so, the, so the emotional, see, one thing about emotions I like is it's a fair system. It's one of the only systems in the universe that's fair. You have access to your emotions. If you have access to your emotions, you have access to your emotions. You can't selectively numb. You can't feel the good ones and avoid the bad ones. So if you're, if you're suppressing your emotion, you're suppressing all of them. So as I became more aware of sadness, I started to have actually more access to joy. I started to feel more optimistic. I had a more positive outlook on life. I had a better sense of meaning, a better sense of purpose. Um, as a result of being sad, I ironically just became a lot happier, which I know does not make any sense. Um, but uh, I, I don't think a lot of this stuff does make any sense, logically speaking. And so I moved to Los Angeles. Um, I, my time in Nashville was sort of up. I moved to Los Angeles at the time. Uh, my, my friend and teacher, and actually my wife now, opened a, a treatment center. Art's probably familiar with the beginning of refuge recovery. They started a treatment center in LA called Refuge Recovery. And they kind of talked me into moving there and working there, although I didn't really want to get in treatment anymore. Um, so I did that. And then I, I started to, which could be a huge long story. So I'm not going to get sucked into the weeds on that one. Um, but personally, I was, I, I was doing really better than I ever had. 
Uh, I was about, I just turned 40. Um, I was in LA for two years. Um, and then what really launched me into what I do now, uh, in 2016, I was in a motorcycle accident in Los Angeles. Uh, somebody took an illegal left turn on Vermont and Hollywood and hit me. Uh, and I, I almost died with a really bad accident. I shattered my pelvis and I was in the ICU for about two weeks. And when I was in the ICU, I was on boatloads of medical grade fentanyl and I was in an ICU psychosis and I had the most horrible nightmare, uh, delusion, dreams for about two weeks. Um, luckily, I, they put me back together. Okay, when I came back too, uh, and I kind of went home and I was healing. Uh, one thing about almost dying, I don't recommend, but one, one, of the, one of the upsides of almost dying is you get your priorities together pretty quickly. Um, all of a sudden, it can be, all of a sudden, it becomes very, very clear what you should be doing. Uh, and you're actually, I was able to just do that. Um, so I um, decided we, I'd always wanted to move to Colorado where I live now. We live in Paonia. And uh, my sister had been here for 20 years. My parents moved here 10 years ago. Um, so we left LA, we came out here. And then I started working really closely, which is uh, kind of full story here. I started working really closely with a friend of mine named Eve Ekman, whose father is Paul Ekman, who's one of the world's most renowned emotion researchers who actually created a bunch of programs with the Dalai Lama. Uh, around cultivating emotional balance, around integrating, and this is this is this is the marriage of the worlds I love, integrating science, science of emotions, Western psychology, all the th things we know about that in our culture with Buddhist meditation, um, integrating those two practices and bringing them together so that you're using the emotions for their intended purposes from a science perspective, but you're using the contemplative practices of meditation of Buddhist practice as the vehicle to get into these emotions because they're not always so pleasant to, to be in. And then um, reflecting on my own experience uh, at that point, well, one of the things that I woke up to during that work was actually the truth is, uh, yes, I have trauma, yes, I have addiction, but the biggest area of suffering in my life and still up to this day is emotional. Um, uh, me and my mind are pretty good. We, we get along okay. Uh, my body's okay. Emotions are brutal. And I started to recognize, and I think this is true. I don't think it's always about it, but, but one of the things I'm so uh, passionate about is teaching emotional intelligence and emotional awareness in addiction treatment, early stages of addiction treatment. Because when it comes to relapse, when it comes to triggers, when it comes to all of that, I believe, and this is just what I found, what I've noticed over the years, the biggest engine that drives addiction is emotion. And it's what they call, what's classified as destructive emotions. In that um, people who use drugs and alcohol are called auto-regulators. And it turns out all human beings have to regulate their emotions. And if you can't regulate your emotions yourself, and you can't form healthy relationships with other human beings to help you regulate your emotions, you're stuck auto-regulating, which means that you have to engage in a behavior or a substance to make the emotional experience somewhat tolerable. And for me, I think, I think if we could teach quality education around emotions and give people some basic, basic emotional awareness skills, which actually is not that hard to develop, 30 days, 60 days, you can get this shit under control. It, it turns out emotions aren't as elusive as we think they are. They're really not that mystical that um, I think that we could, I think that we could help. I think we could get the numbers down 50%. Uh, and I have a friend of mine uh, in, in Los Angeles named Evan Armani, who's got a treatment center called Multi-Concept Recovery, who's, do, who's using my curriculum and they're having great results. They're opening another place in Indiana. And so, you know, we don't talk about them so much, but I, I really think that for most of us, if we're honest, what really gets us is our emotions. Sadness, anger, shame, disgust, contempt. It also, as much as Buddhism universalizes the mind, it turns out from a science perspective, emotions are also universal. You know, we all, we all have them. They're, they're part of our neurobiology, evolutionary biology. Human beings, as we evolved, these emotions came online. They're here to stay. You're not getting rid of them. 
Um, and so um, using that as kind of, you know, for me, actually it turned out that turned out to be the vehicle of my, my most of my happiness right now is actually emotional. Um, where most of my suffering used to be emotional. Um, the emotions are still there. I still get sad. I still feel shame. I still feel all the emotions, but I'm able to use them for their intended purpose. And I don't get caught up in my narrative about this sad person or this angry person. I'm just able to, to use them for their intended purposes. And uh, I think they get a bad reputation. If you look on YouTube, I have a couple of different talks uh, back when we used to travel and I used to give talks, not on Zoom from my house, I used to give a lecture called The War on Emotions. And I believe as a culture and a society, we've sort of declared war on emotions as much as we declared a war on addiction. To some degree, we've declared a war on human suffering. And we suffer from this notion that if we're having a hard time or we're suffering in some way, we pathologize that. Like there's somehow something wrong with us if we're having a bad feeling about what's going on in our lives. And, and our culture sets us up to fail. You know, it sets us up to fail. Any, any bad feeling or any bad mood or any bad mental state or any bad thought I have is like diagnosed now, you know? And um, we, we just got to get away from this pathologizing human suffering uh, and really actually use it. Uh, and nobody does a better job, frankly, of turning human suffering uh, into joy and meaning and happiness than the recovering addict. You know, that's the greatest miracle story to be told. You know, who to who, the human beings who, and, and all of you out there who have been through it, whether your family members have been through it, uh, you know, it, it, it's the greatest overcoming of a human struggle. Uh, it, it's one of the hardest things that we have to do and it can be done. People do it all the time. People do it every day. Uh, and, 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 to, and, and to work in that world and to be in that world. And that's why I totally respect Art and, guy, and you guys and the work that you're doing because uh, people need this. Um, and, 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 you know, and people do it, we do it, you know, and, uh, and, and, to, and to witness it and to be part of it um, has really been is super meaningful to me. Uh, it continues to be super meaningful to me. And, um, and, you know, you can do it. Anybody can do it. You know, it, it's something that happens. And, and, you know, I think having a positive attitude and a positive outlook about this stuff is super, super important because, uh, you know, as a culture, we, we treat addicts like criminals. You know, you know, you're more likely to go to prison than you are to go to treatment in our society. Um, and ironically, prison is more than treatment anyway. We should just put everybody in treatment. It'd be fucking cheaper. Um, but that's a whole nother story. But uh, that, that's what I wanted to share with you tonight. I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, I know that's, that's a lot, but uh, uh, that's sort of my, uh, my process and stuff. So uh, happy to turn it back over. Uh, you can ask me anything. I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid to talk about anything uh, and anything that's on your mind, anything I can do to, to be helpful. That's really my, always my intention is to try to be helpful. So thank you, everybody. All thank right. You. Thank you, Dave. Um, so at this point, we're going to ask some questions. Um, Angie's going to man that. Um, if you have any questions, just raise your hand or however it was done last time. Yeah, so let me tell you how it works, guys. There is a raise your hand feature on your screen um, and you can do that and I'll see it and you'll you'll be in line. But sometimes people can't figure out how to raise your hand with the raise your hand feature. So you literally can raise your hands. There's lots of screens though. I can't see everybody at once. So you would just need to just be patient, get my attention. You can unmute yourself. Uh, that's another way, um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're open for any questions. Uh, we'd love, uh, we'd love to uh, get any of your questions or thoughts uh, for Dave. So who's first? Dave, I just have to say, oh, good. We've got Kristen first. But let me say, while I'm unmuting Kristen, I, Dave, I, I just really want to say thank you for sharing. I, I, I just sat there in amazement uh, listening to your personal story. Uh, you know, we, we met you a couple of years ago and it was more the practice. Uh, we got to see that side of you and I didn't get to know any of this personal stuff. And so, wow. Um, just, just an honor to, to be able to hear your story. So thank you for thank sharing. You. Thank you for having me for sure. Yeah. All right, Kristen. Yeah, that was fantastic. I loved that. Um, I was not distracted at all. And there's a lot of times when I'm distracted 
And I know meditation would help me be less distracted, right? Like sure. quiet, my mind, they all know, my mind is really loud. And I know I need, I would benefit from meditation. So can you maybe tell us some pointers on where to start? Yeah, I mean, fortunately, we live in a world now with this app for it. I mean, meditation's everywhere, right? So that that's kind of good. And I think about it as um, distraction's a tough one. I mean, everybody's mind, we have this monkey mind. The mind wanders and it's not, we don't want to pathologize that either, right? Like, okay, my mind's all over the place. Everybody's mind's all over the place. Um, but what we, what, what we really want to focus on is the opposite of distraction, which is really attention. And that uh, you want to start to think about attention as your great, just mental resource. The most, and this has been proved by cognitive science alike, really the most valuable thing that you can do with your mind is focus on something. So when you're focusing on your phone and you're flipping through all the terrible news and all the stuff that's going on and you're doom scrolling, that's what you're paying attention to and you're feeling like shit. It's like, you know, it's like we consume all this like psychological junk food. You know, it's all like Dr. Pepper, Cool Ranch, Doritos and M&Ms for the mind. And then we feel like shit. What you pay attention to is going to have a tremendous effect, especially on your emotions. So just in a general sense, you know, take more walks, get off of the phone, do something nice for yourself, do something that's enjoyable. Let your attention be in pleasant, enjoyable, meaningful experiences, you know, on purpose. And, and then as far as meditation, you can just do, you know, do five minutes a day of, of just focusing on the sensations of your in and out breath. And when you notice your mind wander, just come back, you know, do that for five minutes. If that goes okay, do it for 10. And just, uh, it's just a practice and your mind is going to wander and it's okay. But you, you, you want to be able to have, the, 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 in emotional science work, the, 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 the formula is very easy. It's awareness plus choice equals freedom. So if I'm aware of what's going on and I can choose what I pay attention to, I can choose whether I eat the cookie or don't eat the cookie or take the drink or don't take the drink. Uh, is that, that that's when we feel free is when we feel like we have choice over what we pay attention to and what we do. And distraction is really what deteriorates that. Yeah. The multitasking, the doom scrolling, the TV's on, I got the phone in my hand, you know, that kind of, and it's hard to not get caught in it because distraction kind of can feel pleasant. It's kind of like a poor man's volume. It's like when we're, when the mind, when we're not focused on anything, we, we're, 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 so, we're so disconnected from our experience. And when things are hard, like they have been, you bet your ass I wanna be disconnected from my experience. I actually don't wanna be in the present moment. I actually don't wanna deal with any of this shit. So what I do is I disconnect into distraction as a kind of medication, as almost like a, an aspirin, an Advil. Uh, and that's not bad or wrong either, but we can do better than that. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, those are just some things to think about. But, but really, the big point is that you want to understand the attention, your ability to pay attention is your greatest resource. I and love when you said, wonder it. when you are not using your mind, your mind is using you. That was just that's, like, I was like, wow, that's great. Yeah, who's, who's running the show here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we've got more people online. We've got David Hicks and then Sonia. So David Hicks, can we turn your camera on so we can see ya? And let me take Kristen off spotlights. Hey, David, are you there? Nope. Hey, David, was that an accident? Or did you have a question? There go. Hey, uh -huh. there. I'm having a uh, cursor issues here. Let's see. Okay. And you did have a question, David? Or Wait, was I, did. I did. I did. So, um, enjoyable topic on um, emotions. I, I just wondered, a thought occurred to me is, uh, um, is there any usefulness in experimenting in, you know, sort of dredging up different kinds of emotional emotions uh, just for the sake of trying to experience them and build up your repertoire, I guess, or is that kind of going down a rabbit hole? Well, it can go either way. It's actually interesting you bring this up. You know, Ekman has practices for this, and I do, I do them with my students all the time. It's called trigger practice, 
where you actually try to turn on the physiology of emotion so that you can work with it in real time. But um, so you can do that, there's exercises for that. But you wanna make sure that, you know, it, it can be uh, overwhelming. So I don't teach it to everybody. Um, and it's good to have some help, um, but you can try, you know, because memories a lot of times are the doorway to emotion. So like method actors do this all the time. Like people who have to cry on camera, they turn on the sadness emotion. They, you know, it's, it's actually doable. So if you, if you wanting to explore emotions, you can try to do different things to turn on the physiology of the emotion and then try to work with it meditatively to get a sense for how it feels and how it works. So yeah, that's definitely doable. Uh, I don't know that it's a rabbit hole. Um, you know, it can be upsetting for some of us and it can be traumatizing depending on your experience and where you are, but that, that kind of thing's kind of good to have a guide. How do you know if you have had a trauma? Uh, well, you know, you could, the best thing to do is to just go get like a professional assessment which you could probably do them online at this point where you just answer a bunch of questions and uh, there's a bunch of them out there. Uh, they take stuff and take very long. You know, if you don't know if you had them or not, it's good to just go get, go get actually a clinical assessment and have some professional person look at it and they can give you, give you a pretty fair assessment if you do or you don't. Most people know if they have, <laughs> you know? but some people not so much. So it's good. I think it's good to get a, to get a, a actual proper clinical assessment. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, David. Okay, we've got Sonia next. Can we get you unmuted? Hello. Hey. Hi. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, a lot of that resonated with me. I used to be a drug and alcohol counselor and I'd be teaching people um, like how to regulate their emotions and things like that. And recently I'm learning that I'm not very good at it myself. <laughs> so um, what are some things you've done to gain this emotional intelligence and managing the other emotions? You know, one thing that was interesting to me that I didn't suspect would happen is actually just some good old fashioned education. Like you could go pick up like Paul Ekman's book called Emotions Revealed, or actually there's this great thing. It's a free online resource called atlasofemotions.com. It's good to just know that the, the, the seven universal emotions. So this, you know, know the universal emotions, know their function, just like learning about these things actually can be very, very helpful. And then starting to understand when you look at the list, which ones do you think you have access to? Like, okay, like you might be like, well, fear for me, not so bad. Was, you know, just getting, getting, uh, I'm trying to understand your emotional profile uh, and being like, oh, gee, shame. I never feel that one. Or gee, I feel that one all the time. Okay. And then you get you get a range of sense of okay where your where your work might need where you might and it, it's usually usually you can tell you know which ones you can kind of work with but it's good to just know what they are. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. All right, so I'm getting some feedback that maybe um, the spotlighting isn't uh, working as 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 uh, well as I was thinking. Uh, is that the case? Hey, Art, is the spotlight working well? for you. It's a new feature that I can spotlight both um, Dave and then whoever's asking the question, but I'm getting some feedback that maybe it's not working out so well. Here, maybe they're not in spotlight view. Okay, so it's working out fine for you? It is. You okay. Just it might, back. okay, it might be maybe that person is on a phone and so it doesn't um, translate as well on a phone versus um, like my screen, it seems to be working really well on the laptop. Me and Kyle have some questions when you're. Great. Well, let's do David Hicks has another question and then we'll do uh, you guys. Uh, okay. David, let's get you unmuted. There you go. Go ahead. So is this related to the uh, the book called Sedona, the Sedona Method? And if so, do you have an opinion about, he, he the author of that book had a strong opinion about avoiding negative emotions and only focusing on the positive. And I, I kind of felt like, well, yeah, I'm a whole spectrum. I'm not a narrow spectrum. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know that book, but that guy's totally way off because you can't do that. So um, the, 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 the way they classify, the way emotion, science of emotion folks classify emotions, we actually have to stay away from this negative positive business uh, because that's actually just not how it, how it is. Of course, 
there's emotions that are pleasant, there's emotions that are unpleasant, but it's not a great measuring stick. The measuring stick is whether the emotion is constructive or destructive. That's what we want to understand. Like anger. Most people would say anger is a negative emotion, right? Totally not true. Anger can be very constructive. It can be very, very useful, especially if you have to set boundaries with somebody, if you need to advocate for yourself, if you have a challenges that you need to overcome. All the emotions have a role, they have a purpose, and we need to learn what the purpose is and learn how to use it properly. So it's not whether anger is negative or positive. The question is, do I have a constructive relationship to anger or do I have a destructive relationship to anger? And it's usually a mixed bag. Sometimes I do pretty good when I'm angry. Sometimes I don't do so good. So you have to understand that in, in emotion episodes, we either feel good about what we did or we feel regrettable about what we did. So we, when you think about emotions, you really want to get away from this negative positive business because it, it creates a lot of problems that don't need to be created. So yeah, that, that whole feel the good ones, avoid the bad ones. Like I throw that book right in the trash. <laughs> or just, you know, start drinking again. Like that's what that's all about, you know? <laughs> Great. Thanks for that question, David. All right. Uh, so, Art, the crew has some questions there. Yeah, Kyle's got a question. I was just wondering if you could possibly just explain Dharma. Oh, boy, that's a can of worms. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I can. I can try a little bit. So it, it's a very hard word to translate into English. So on one on one level, uh, I, I'm much more interested in the Dharma than I am in Buddhism. Buddhism is the world's religion with all the baggage right. of all the other religions. Now, the Buddha didn't teach Buddhism. The Buddha taught the Dharma. And, and so the Dharma is translated as kind of, um, it's a practice. So it's something that you practice. Um, and it, it's... Uh, it's really practicing with your experience, or you could say your mind, or whatever you want to call it. You're, you're, you're understanding that your mind has a kind of operating system, and that your, your, your mind has its own sort of behavior. So the Dharma is sort of like the way in which things operate, like the fact that I like pleasure, I like pleasure and I hate pain. That's a Dharma teaching. Like that actually happens to be true. I actually totally fucking hate pain. You know, like, oh, wow. And so uh, the Buddha is asking us to check these things out. And then we're practicing. And really what Dharma practice is about is trying to liberate ourselves from these destructive behaviors, from destructive views, from things that don't really work. So ultimately, really, it's all about happiness. Actually, to me, it's all about recovery. Dharma, Dharma is a recovery thing. It's recovering from my tendencies to create unnecessary suffering for myself. Because um, you, you said that there was something that happened in your life um, when you were younger, I think you said when you were 18 and you just heard, you heard something about the Dharma and, and that forever kind of just clicked. Like That's right. What was it that, do you remember exactly what it was? I just- Totally, I'll never forget what it was. Yeah. It was, you know, sitting in, in the meditation hall with my first Dharma teacher uh, doing mindfulness of breathing, <laughs> you know? It, 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 and it was like, you know, just like taking my attention and putting it on my breathing and realizing that I didn't have to actually live in my thoughts in my mind 24 seven. That there was, there, was, there, was, there was other things going on than what I was thinking about. Right. I lived in my mind. And then I started to see like, oh, okay. Like, so then it came to be like, oh, I actually can have a relationship to my mind. I thought my mind was just this fixed kind of piece of crap engine that I lived in. <laughs> that I was just stuck with. I just got stuck with a shitty mind and that's just how it's going to be forever. And I started, well, wait a minute here. Actually, that's not what's happening. What's happening here is the mind is behaving in a certain kind of way, but I can make adjustments. There's things that I can do about it. It's not fixed. And this is what neuroplasticity is, right? The neuroscience, neuroplasticity. The mind is neuroplastic. The mind is not fixed. It's an open system. And, and, and anything is possible. And so... That was enough of an idea for me to feel encouraged and inspired to try to make some actual changes. Okay, all right, yeah. Great, good question, Kyle. Anybody totally. else there that's, with the crew the have a question? question? Yeah, I got some first. Yeah. So I missed my appointment yesterday with Dave. I was uh, on Monday. We, me and Dave usually have a session on Monday. And it's odd that you said uh, 
um, anger is useful or that anger helps you with boundaries. Because just today, I mentioned to somebody that I can't keep it. And I want to keep it. Like, I want to be angry. And I want to stay angry. Or I have something that it, that it, I need the protection of anger and I can't keep it. And, um, you know, the same thing with compassion. Can there be too much? Can it be not useful? Can it be just a destructive thing, compassion? Yeah, I can. You know, it's a, you know, it's like the parents who love their children to death, right? Yeah. You know, that, that kind of, and so interestingly enough, from a, so constructive anger would be the secular way that we, constructive anger and compassion are the same thing. Anger and compassion are very similar, actually. But the compassion is, is a skillful, it's a constructive relationship to the anger. It's that anger that says, that creates the boundary. Says, hey, you know what, man? You know, what? you know, you can't talk to me like that. You know, like we're not. This isn't going to happen anymore. I, I'm, you know, and I'm not getting rid of you. I'm not actually angry and hateful towards you. I'm just letting you know that I'm not going to participate in this kind of exchange anymore, dude. But what you know, about what, what about when that anger breaks down and it it just turns on you to a point where it's not there, and you feel a love or you feel a need to want to save or anything like that. And you just can't, you can't keep the boundary. Well, you know, you, 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 you know, you can't get this shit right all the time. You know what I mean? Even the best baseball player only hits the ball three and a half out of 10 times. <laughs> so again, we have to think about it as a practice. You're not always going to be able to do it. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not always, you know, just cause I know this stuff. I, my anger is not always constructive. Sometimes it's actually de destructive still to this day, probably, I, I probably did something today that was a kind of destructive anger, but we, ju we just want to get better. We just want to improve. We just, you know, we want progress, not perfection. You know, you, you're, you're going to drop the ball once in a while. You're going to get angry and you're going to say something to somebody you care about that's mean. You know, you're going to, you're going, that's going to happen. And we have to be, we have to be, we have to realize that we're not perfect. But what if you can't? I don't think can't is a thing. You can't keep it. You just can't keep, you can't be angry and you're trying and you want to be because it protects you and you, you know, you just, it's just difficult. Yeah. Well, there's probably something else happening. What do you think else? What, what would be happening that you think is not allowing the anger to be there? Is there another, there might be another emotion yeah, involved. Just, just brief, but that's you and I, I guess we'll talk more. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Session in. <laughs> um, I want to ask, is it, why do we never hear about the benign um, causes of addiction? You know, you never hear, um, and for the parents who are on here and they hear your story and now they're sifting through their kid's life trying to find the trauma, mm -hmm. is it possible that it's just not there? That it's just- Totally, totally possible. You know, not all addiction is created equal. Yeah. <laughs> and there's people who have had wonderful lives and wonderful parents and they've had everything they've needed and they've been very well taken for and they get strung out on drugs and alcohol. It That's happens. Right. So, you know, this whole, I don't like, and I like Gabor Mate, but I, I'm, very, I'm very suspicious and I always have been of people who try to reduce addiction to one cause. That's right. That's there's right. no cause for, there's no universal cause for addiction. There's multiple contributing factors. Mm -hmm multiple contributing factors genetics can be a factor environment can be a hey some people just like to get high yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. that's why you i get because i didn't feel i wasn't in those shoes i didn't understand what he was saying that wasn't me i came from everything i had it all it wasn't it was given to me five vacations a year two two biological parents a stable home love it was all there and here i am you know, result. Yeah, it's not all created equal. And I think we have to be careful that we don't compare. Not everybody's traumatized. Not everybody has their different story. It doesn't matter what caused it. It matters what the hell you're going to do about it. Yeah. yeah and people get too distracted on that. They're like, well, why do I have it? And what happens? It's like, dude, who, you know, the Buddha talks about this all the time. It's like, there's a problem right in front of you. You have a, you're like, let's deal with the problem. Let's get, get away from the who done it and why it's here and all that stuff. That can be helpful to some degree. But it can kind of take us away from our primary purpose. Beautiful. You guys That's got... a really great distinction. I'm really glad you said that. Yeah. You know, and I've been saying it for a long time, and people push back on it because everybody wants to. Everybody wants to always boil it down to the comment. Well, addiction's all about trauma. Addiction's all about this. You know, for a while it was genetics. Every ten years they got a new theory. 
You know, it, it, you can't boil it down. Well, and if you go by Gabor Mate's theory, then we had a trauma epidemic prior to this recent opioid epidemic. Now, yeah, and totally. And I would argue a very large percentage of addicts do have trauma, but not everybody does. Right. So, you know, we, we have to stay away from this. Well, we can also I, boil it down to supply. Yeah, right. Supply creating demand. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, well-adjusted people who have mommy and daddy's credit card, you know, they got they got a pretty good access to some crazy shit, right? Like, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's pretty addicting stuff. It's fun to do, you know. Yeah. <laughs> We've got a question. Uh, Colette. Thank you, Dave. Keep, yeah, thanks, bro. Let's keep unmuted, Colette. Okay. Hi there. Hi there. Oh. Oh, goodness. So first, I just want to say thank you for your presentation tonight. And so your descriptions just tickle my brain. Yeah, good. <laughs> they just are awesome. It just, uh, but anyways, so I'm a nurse and I'm a mother of an addict. And so obviously in a caregiving profession, as you are. Sure. And so I'm wondering whether it's personally or professionally or, you know, we get, you know, there's compassion fatigue. Um so whether it's in my personal life or my professional life, um, how do you protect yourself from vicarious traumatization? Well, you, you know, you kind of can't, you know, and I, I think that the reality is if you work at a paint store, you're going to get paint on your clothes every day, you know, and, and that's just how it is. So, it, it, so part of it also too is like understanding it's actually not compassion fatigue, it's empathy fatigue. Um, there's a distinction that we need to make. Empathy is not always good. People talk about empathy, empathy, empathy. Empathy can be very destructive because I'm so in, I'm too involved in the other person's experience. I'm too involved in their emotion. In fact, I'm addicted to trying to control them. Mm. Right? Compassion actually, uh, there's compassion. There's no compassion fatigue because when you're in compassion, you're understanding that the, the compassion, the empathy, has to be for yourself first. You know, it's that whole thing about put your oxygen mask on first you know you, you, we we have we ha and this is part of this is very difficult we have to take care of ourselves first and foremost you know self-care is so important and if we put other somebody else's care in front of ours there, there's going to be problems and especially if we put somebody else's care in front of ours, somebody who's involved in very destructive behaviors then they're just going to take it they're going to take you down with them and so um, there's a thing called emotional. So there's three kinds of empathy. There's cognitive empathy, emotional empathy, and then compassion. And so uh, emotional empathy is a beautiful thing because it means that we care, uh, but that can get really, really messy. So we have to develop some skills. A lot of it has to do with boundaries. A lot of it is, is having to let people uh, destroy their lives. And I feel terrible saying that. And it's just, you know, I can barely control my own mind. How the hell am I going to control somebody else's behavior? Right. Well, you know, chain, chain them to the radiator. I mean, that's like what it boils down to, you know? So it, it, it's just hard. And I think the, the, the view that we have to hold is that we have to take care of ourselves for our, our primary job is to take care of ourselves. Um, and ironically, I think the better, the better you take care of yourself, the people around you take better care of themselves. Self-care is kind of contagious. Sure. Unfortunately, so is self-destruction. Hmm. Is there such a thing as empathy, like an empathy drought, or then does it serve a purpose? Like you just don't feel <laughs> well, one way or another. It, well, the thing about it is choice, especially if you work as a nurse. Now you have to be able to turn, you have to be able to switch it off if you need to. Right. And you I can compartmentalize be, really well. I really can do yeah. it. But, and that gets yeah. a bad, you know, that gets a bad reputation, compartmentalizing or what they call suppression. But you know what? Sometimes you have to do it. Now you probably have to deal with it later. But in the heat of the moment, if you're if you're a nurse, if you're dealing and working in a treatment center and there's a crisis, you can't. If there's a crisis going on, you can't lose your shit. You got to suppress that emotion. You got to compartmentalize. You got to push through. Right. Um, and that gets a bad reputation. But sometimes we have to do it. Especially if you work, if you, especially if you work in, and I, you know, they used to call it that. The reason I, I know this is because I've had compassion fatigue syndrome twice, a clinical grade compassion fatigue syndrome, which is how I ended up in trauma therapy. Um, so I, I know the territory very, very well. Um, and, you know, we, we just have to, we have to take care of ourselves. And 
you know, I was doing too much. I was in the prison all the time. I was in treatment centers all the time. I was spending 40, 50 hours a week in rooms with people who were suffering terribly. And you know what? It got all over me. Yeah. It's contagious. You know, it's like, you know, it's like the COVID, man. It's like, you better put your mask on if you're going to go in that room. <laughs> right. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Great Thank question. you so much. We have another question, Laura, Christine. And we have 10 minutes left. So anybody else get in line so we can get your questions. Let's see. Can we get you unmuted, Laura, Christine? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Hi. Perfect. Hi. Hi, Dave. Thank you for sharing um, your story. Honestly, this is the second time I've, um, I live in Denver and um, we had had you as a special guest a couple months ago, maybe. And it was just really wonderful. And just everything that you say and what you're about, um, cause I've been doing recovery Dharma for eight months and I almost nine. Yeah. And I found it in treatment. I've never heard of it before. And for me, the Dharma is a way of life for me now. Sure. The way I, the way I live by a lot, you know, the practice of it, you know, I do my best with a lot of things, you know, I'm human. Um, I've had a lot of trauma, trauma in my past, you know, and I just, like most addicts, numb them with things, you know, alcohol or drugs or what have you. And, you know, I just, working through with the Dharma gives me the tools to really get down, because I'm, I'm also doing a group of investigations with some um, Sangha sisters. And so I'm just, I don't know, I just, I, I could, I just, so many great things about the Dharma. And I just, it's my way of life. I practice it every day. I facilitate an all women's group. Um, for um, recovery dharma and I don't know I just guess my question is for you um, when, when, it, when in meditation I know you always come back to the breath but what if because I've had some times where things where I'm really tense and I cannot do it I try and I try and I try yeah, sure. yeah and it's just it's not and my mind won't have a lot of noise going on but I, I'm like, I st like I'm breathing, but I'm not breathing. Sure. And then I try to come back and it's just not there. Well, you know, you don't always have to come back to the breath. That's another thing. And I, I say that because that's sort of your p pedigree intro. You, the, you, the breath doesn't, you know, I don't actually use breathing for an anchor anymore. I use my body. If, if, if you're trying to use an anchor and it's not working, you should get a different anchor. The breath doesn't work for you. You can use your knees. Actually, the thing about the, that's interesting, the Buddha doesn't care what your anchor is, actually. It doesn't matter. It could be your left pinky fingernail. It doesn't matter what you come back to. It's the coming back that matters. You can come back to metta. You can come back to a sense of kindness. So you, your job is to learn what you can come back to that feels restorative, that feels like you have a capacity to be with that experience. You're like, well, I can be with my belly, or I can be with my shoulder. Whatever you can be, if you can't be with your breath, then you want to get a different object. And it's not your fault. There's no reason why, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of reasons why the breath can be problematic. So you want to play around a little bit and be a little more liberal. And, 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 and when, when, when it comes to embodiment or the term that I prefer is somatic experience, come back to a sound. You can come back to different things. You can come back to your nose. You can come back to your left thumb next time. It doesn't matter. It's just that you're unhooking from the mind and you're returning to something that's present moment adjacent at least. So play around a little bit. There's no rules here. And if the breath doesn't work, get rid of it. Do something else. Thank you, Laura Christine. I, there was some weird feedback, so I muted you there. Thank you. Was that good? That was your yeah. okay, beautiful. Uh, Tracy, are you next? I'm ready. Hey. Um, hi, everybody. Happy New Year. Hey, I kind of jumped on here a little late, but you just said a word um, to me that resonates really well, and it's self-care. Would you mind just enlightening us a little bit on your perspective of self-care? Sure, yeah, no, it's kind of a buzzword. It's so easy to say self-care, right? But what the hell does that look like? Um, you know, it, it's a lot of things. Um, a lot of it, and I think it always starts with the body. That means we have to we have to take care of our body. We have to sleep. Uh, we have to we have to eat okay. Uh, we we have to sort of take care of our bodies a little bit. Um, we have to do things that are enjoyable to us and meaningful to us. 
And if you don't have things that are joyful or meaningful to you, you damn well better find some things that are. Uh, because the, the world is, is a negative attention bias vacuum. The world is trying to get you to pay attention to things that are negative and destructive. And I don't know why that is, but that just seems like, so you have to, you have to take care of yourself. You have to do things for you. You have to do things that feel generous for you, uh, whether that's taking a hot bath or going and getting a meal that you like or uh, going for a walk. It doesn't actually matter what it is. You have to be generous with yourself. You have to do things for yourself that feel friendly, that feel generous, that feel good. You know, and you know, and so, um, and you have to do something like that every day. And then, yeah, it's not rocket science. It's, you know, it's do things that are enjoyable, uh, and, and 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 don't put other people's needs in front of yours all the time. Sometimes we have to, right? After we have kids and family, you know, some of us need to actually be more selfish. We couldn't hear you there, Tracy. You got muted. I, I just said you. thumbs up. I agree <laughs> because sometimes I know for me personally, when I'm, well, there's guilt and I'm trying to sit with that guilt and try to understand why I feel guilty for putting myself first. And so um, thanks for sharing. And Tracy, well, we live in a, yeah, we live oh, in a sorry. culture that, that kind of, uh, you get socially rewarded for that kind of thing. So it's not so great. So you shouldn't feel guilty. I mean, and if you do, you do, you should just, you should do it anyway. You should do it in spite of the guilt. Hey, Tracy, I just want to add to, uh, I know you uh, caught on late tonight. You're going to want to watch the recording. You're going to really enjoy Dave's story. So when I post it, be sure and watch it. You'll really enjoy it. Um, all right. Thank you, Tracy. Okay. We have time for one more question or maybe two. If there's anybody else out there, uh, give me a raise, Tan. I see a hand at the bottom, Kristen Lindstrom. I see a hand. All right, let me find Kristen. I'm looking for you. Can you unmute yourself, Kristen? Yeah, I'm unmuted. All right. Got me. Okay, so I went to college um, in the 70s and it was kind of the cool thing to meditate then. And yeah, I remember right. I had, yes, and I had, people in my shared house who would go up into the um, attic and they would meditate. And I, you know, so, and I don't exactly know what they did, but you know, it was the cool thing to do. It was sort of hippie dumb. Yeah, right. And yeah. So then years later, um, when I was going to graduate school, I, there weren't enough hours in the day and I was working during the day and going to school at night. And so I started this, practice where I had to rest in between and I sat in my car for 20 minutes before I went into classes and I did this kind of practice because I'd read about meditation and I started off at the top of a spiral staircase and I took myself down to the bottom slowly and when I got to the bottom I just said safe to myself I'm safe and I stayed there for I stayed there for 20 minutes and I blocked everything else out there were no I didn't let any thoughts in I just said I'm safe down here and as I descended the staircase I was thinking I get to the bottom and I'm safe and then I would walk go back visually go back up and then my then I would walk into class and the reason why I did that was because it was like I took a and I it got to be where I did, was doing it every day I didn't have to set a clock it was a 20 minute lapse and it was like I'd slept all night and I could go again. And so that was kind of what I did. And it, the more I did it, the better I got at it, the more restful it was. And it was almost like, like I was developing a muscle. I haven't done it, but I found that the more that I did it, the better I got at it, the more restful it was. And I guess that was meditation because I didn't do anything down there at the bottom. I did nothing. And, I, and it wasn't even, I, I don't, uh, what I remember is when I got back up to the top, it was like I'd slept all night. I was refreshed. I guess my question is to you, so why is, and I think that's, I think that was meditation. I, I don't know what it was. 
it was nothing else was going on at the bottom there. When I came up, I was, I was, I was good. Uh, I was ready to start. Um, why is that good for an addict? And is that, is that the kind, does it offer them relief? Does it, is it restorative? Why does an addict want to know that practice? And, and I don't even know if what I did was meditation. I just know it was a rest for me. It was yeah, a no. reset. It was a reset. That's yeah, no. the way I, I don't, you know, it was a de-escalation kind of of my head. So theoretically, what you were doing with a concentration practice, you were focusing on one experience and blocking everything out. That's okay. what happens when you have focused concentration, is you're able to do that. A lot of everybody can do that. That's good. You're able to do that. Some people can do it, but others. Also, too, of course, I have a bias here. I don't think everybody should meditate. I don't think all addicts need to meditate. It's not for everybody, right? Like, oh, I, I, okay. I, I, know, I know that. Um, of course, now the research is saying that, it, that it's good for you. And there's different kinds of meditations. The word meditation is a huge can of worms, first of all. There's different kinds. And, and so uh, Buddhist, the reason I like Buddhist meditation is if you look at the world's libraries of different spiritual traditions, religious traditions, the Buddhists certainly have really dedicated their whole, their whole endeavor to meditation. Like we can't argue about that, right? Right. So uh, they, 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 really Buddhist meditation is classified as only, only three kinds. There's concentration, developing attention, there's the cultivation of awareness or mindfulness, and then there's the development of the heart, uh, compassion and loving kindness. And so really, you know, in the annals of the Buddhist libraries on meditation, almost, I would argue every single one could be put in one of those categories. Okay. So, you know, it's good to practice all three. Some people need one or so more than the others. Um, but even, you know, you know, even the research, like the work of Daniel Goleman on emotional intelligence, there's a lot of emotionally intelligent people out there who've never meditated one second in their life. Um, however, the thing, the thing, the reason why I think it's good for addicts, and this is just my opinion, is that I think to a large degree, the problem they're having is emotions. They're having, they're, they're not able to manage their emotions very well. And it turns out that Buddhist meditation techniques are the most effective way for somebody to learn how to self-regulate their emotional experience so that they can move through the world with more ease. So I, I just think it's an efficient way to go about it. It's certainly not for everybody. It's certainly not the only way, but if people can recognize it, that sort of what happens is they become emotional and then they go use drugs, uh, that kind of thing, it's the trigger, then, then it probably is in their best interest to kind of try to practice or learn or to at least you know, be open-minded to try some of these meditation techniques because there's a good chance they're gonna be helpful. Okay, so it's almost like you, you can use it as a tool it's really a tool. You say a, as a tool to sort of intervene on yourself almost. Couldn't have said it better. That's exactly right. Okay. And it's a simple tool. Pretty simple. Once you start, once you start to use it, I think. Once I mean, you start all the good recovery skills. That's why I love this stuff. All the skills are easy. It's just okay. trying to get the damn people to try it. <laughs> Thank you, Thanks. Kristen. All right. Well, it's time to wrap up. Do you have any closing thoughts, Jeff? Nope. I just wanted to say thank you. That was really powerful. Um, question for you, though, Dave, is if somebody wanted to reach out to you, read your book, connect with you, how would they do that? The best thing to do is go to my website, which has everything on it. It's, it's davesmithdharma.com. Uh, Dave Smith and then Dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A, -A, uh, Dave Smith Dharma. I think you even put it on the Facebook thing. Everything I do, is you can pretty much get to anything I've ever done on my site. The other thing that I have, I have a couple online classes right now, and I do have an online class that starts February 1st, a Buddhist recovery online class and community. Uh, that's a subscription-based thing where there's a weekly group that I teach every week, uh, and there's a there's an online content. It's actually like a college class, university class. You actually, I kind of take you through the, cur the curriculum and the understanding of Buddhist recovery. Then we have these weekly Zooms every week um, and people have been signing up and my, me and my wife, Shannon, uh, are teaching that. And so that if you're, if you're gonna be home a lot and you wanna, you wanna do some of this stuff and you wanna get some kind of uh, guidance and it, it, that, that's an option, that's on my homepage. You can find out more about that. But I'm really psyched to have that. And, and the world of Zoom, Zoom's pretty good, right? Like this is pretty good. Yes. So, um, I'm happy that I can offer a really robust 
really uh and, and the, the, the online content is you know there's tons of videos there's 20 guided meditations there's lots of stuff in there it's like a, taking a class and and then with, with the zoom it's like uh, we can really we can get a lot accomplished pretty quickly this way so yeah so that's one of the things that i'm doing uh, in the next year since i won't be traveling but yeah anything i do is on my website i have free podcasts i have lots of free resources on my site all right and do you do any one-on-one I do. If you go to my, on, on my site, there's a, I think there's a, a tab called services. And if okay. you look, if you go to services, you can see, I do one-on-one mentoring. I do, I do quite a, quite a, quite a lot of different things. Awesome. To, to keep my ADD happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Dave Smith. Thank, thank you. you so much, Dave. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. And thank you, Jeff, for being our host. Thank you so much. And have we'll a great be- night, everybody. We'll be back on our regular Tuesdays next week. Thank you, everyone. Next month, Evan Haynes from uh, Owl House in Malibu, California. Good friend of mine and a uh, friend of Jeff, friend of the program. One of my old business partners, uh, Evan Haynes, is going to be speaking and uh, taking questions next uh, February. So, um, or in February is our February. spot. Yep, February 23rd. Once again, thank you all for tuning in. Good night. Thank you. Oh, yes. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.